That's why we have to focus on that revenue limit increase. Um, so what I wanted to do was quantify these things and show what would what will the budget look like? What kind of situation will we be facing um, in, a, in a host of different scenarios, uh, different outcomes for the state biennium budget? Uh, it's important to note that as we go into these scenarios, it could go up, it could go down. Um, this, these scenarios truly represent the best estimate of what we have today. Um, as factors iron out, the scenarios will become more fine-tuned. The membership of our district, or you can think of it as enrollment as well, literally the number of students within our district, will heavily impact these scenarios. For now, we're projecting flat membership, that is no change in membership. Um, you'll also note that in every single scenario, uh, the current year, 22-23, will show a deficit. That's explicitly because the board has approved um, funds to be taken out of fund balance. And by definition, in order to take funds out of fund balance, because fund balance is not tracked by one year specifically, um, all at once, I should say, um, we have to, you have to run a bit of a, you have to run a deficit in order to pull out a fund balance. Um, so every single situation is going to reflect the approved capital projects for the summer, taking out a fund balance, and now the football field and softball and baseball field renovations, which will also partially come out of fund balance. Um, so that's why that deficit is there. It's best to take note of the trends of these scenarios, which one's worse, which one's best, um, and to what degree. Like I've said, the numbers themselves will become ironed out as, as we iron out our assumptions, as we iron out details in the weeks ahead here. So with that disclaimer, um, let's, let's look at these guys. Um, the scenario, first scenario that I have, so I have six scenarios and it kind of goes from worst case scenario to best case scenario. So scenario number one is the state does nothing. This is a literal repeat of the last biennium. So that is a $0 increase, the revenue limit, $0 increase, the categorical aid and zero uh, and no increase to special ed reimbursement. We're currently at 30%. Um, so again, just looking at those three levers and how they, they may impact the district. Um, so what that would spell out is, so prim primarily looking at here, we have the overall revenues in fund 10, the overall expenses in fund 10, and then the surplus or deficit. And that's kind of the main line to focus on is that second to last one. What kind of surplus or deficit in a given fiscal year would we be looking at? Um, so as you can see in this scenario, we'd be looking at a $1.6 million deficit next year. Um, which would decrease our fund balance. And then once the ESSER funds go away in their entirety, and this is the, the true quantification of that fiscal cliff we've been talking about, we would look at a $3.8 million deficit in 24-25. Yes. In the current biennium, would that also include 21-22? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So we would, yeah, the current biennium that we're currently in, we're in year two of it. Is Correct. there a way we could, you could, give us 21, 22, just to see the trend? Yeah, yeah, we could look at historical yeah. data too. Um, but today I just mainly, the, the, the main point of my, my, the main emphasis of this presentation is really next year and the future, but definitely we could look at historical data as well. Thanks. For sure. And feel free to ask questions as, as we go along. Um, scenario number two. That would be a minor change in the biennium. So I would say $200 per pupil in the revenue limit, uh, $200 increase the revenue limit, um, everything else remaining the same. So in this scenario, we'd be looking at a $1.2 million deficit next year. And when the ESSER funds are depleted, a potential $3 million deficit, $3 million deficit in 24-25. In scenario number three, we have a medium change to the biennium. This would be a scenario when we're looking at um, $250 per pupil for the revenue limit, and then a 5% increase to special ed reimbursement. So a 5% increase next year, and then maintain that increase the year after that. In this situation, we'd be looking at an $800,000 deficit in the next year in 23-24, and a $2.4 million deficit in 24-25. Scenario number four is a larger change to the biennium. 
So if we saw a $300 per pupil increase this year, next year, and, and the year after that, and then a 5% increase to special ed reimbursement next year, and then a further 10% um, special ed reimbursement increase the year after that, uh, we would see a surplus, sorry, a deficit of $680,000 next year, a deficit of $1.5 million the year after that. So we have quite the range so far. Um, the next scenario I will present is DPI's request. So this is what DPI has asked. Um, so we're looking at next year, a $350 increase to the revenue limit. A year after the year after that, um, $650 increase to the revenue limit. In categorical aid, we'd be seeing $24 increase in revenue limit next year and a $69 increase to the revenue uh, to the categorical aid the year after that. For special aid, ed reimbursement, we'd be looking at a 5% increase next year and then a further 10% increase the year after that. All told, this would fix most of our situation. Um, so we have a surplus next year of about $100,000 and a surplus of the following year after ESSER funds are depleted of $600,000. Um, so I would look at this and say that this is probably within our margin of error. Um, this probably goes to show a mostly balanced budget, especially for next year. Um, so, and I, I guess at this point, I should emphasize that every single scenario we've been looking at, um, there's a lot more room for growth in the budget. Um, I mean, you just look at utilities, for example, and how much they may be going up. Um, there's costs can go up in multiple different ways. So it's all pretty tight in every single scenario as is. Scenario number six is the SWSA's request that we're, we've we're, we're looking at. I did include a document in the board book, um, which is their current documentation saying what laying out what they're what they're asking um, from Madison. Um, all told, it's a fifteen hundred dollar increase to the revenue limit or categorical aid, and SWASA is leaving it up to Madison to determine how that's distributed. It could be majority one year or majority the next year. For just for the purposes of this presentation and simplicity, I just split it out between evenly between the two years. So $1,500 increase to the revenue limit or categorical aid um, over the course of the biennium and a 30% increase to, to special ed reimbursement next year and a further 30% special ed reimbursement the year after that. This would completely turn the tables. Um, we would have a situation um, where we would actually be looking at a surplus next year and the year after that of at least about a, $2 million next year and potentially three the year after that. Um, the thing I will emphasize with this is although we're looking at quite the difference in a monetary impact, um, this gives the district the ability to potentially look at in all inflationary costs and make meet those needs and also make um, make education competitive as compared to other fields. So I it, it, you can look at this and say, well, the district does not cannot possibly use that that much money. I look at this and I think this gives the district potential options as we look at the difficult markets ahead and at the difficult building needs that we have. Um, so I do not think this is outside of the realm of possibility to ask for, to advocate for. Um, I think especially if we're giving Madison the, um, the flexibility to determine how that $1,500 per pupil is spread out over the biennium, and also if we gave them the flexibility within the special ed reimbursement. Um, so I, I think for us as a board, the key takeaway for this SWSA ask is that $1,500 per pupil increase. That I would say is the number that you want to advocate for. Um, and the way that number is determined is simply taking the last two years of what CPI should have been, what district should have gotten, and then multiplying that number by for um, by next year's projected inflation and the year after that. And then you get about $1,500. That's not even the full $3,000 that districts are potentially owed per student as was determined by the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, which we just talked about last time. So- Can I, I 
you know, you're the the guru guru here on school finance. I do, I do need the public needs to know though that we are far behind um, inflationary adjustments in public education. And I I think Dana, you told me at one time that if we had uh, a inflationary adjustment that came pace with inflation since 2008, that we would need a $3,000 um, increase per pupil. Correct. So this, this is not wild-eyed dreaming or asking for something that, that we don't need. We need this kind of funding just to keep pace with inflation and to provide uh, our students with the resources they need and our teachers with inflationary increases in their compensation. That, that is correct. Now, yeah, so just thinking back to last time we looked at the Legislative Fiscal Bureau's report, and that's exactly what they articulated, that um, the revenue limit was intended to be indexed with inflation. Every year was supposed to get a per pupil increase in, in pace with inflation. And the state has rarely done that. Um, now, obviously there's a lot of history between now and 2008 um, so we could ask for $3,000 per pupil, but I think that would be putting that history to the side. Um, so that's why we're looking at $1,500 would make up for the last two years of zero increase and give us some flexibility with next year and the year after that. Um, so this true $1,500 per pupil is truly not um, too much to ask for, from my perspective. Um, we need to be cognizant that these numbers can impact taxes, but we want to give Madison the flexibility to determine how that takes place. Um, so if they were to put it in categorical aid, for example, instead of revenue limit increase, that'll primarily be out of state, the state budget um, instead of property taxes. Um, so all that to say, Madison has the ability to mitigate our deficit situation. We'll have to see if it takes place. Um, and it's hard to say. Do we happen to know, is it $4 billion, $5 billion in surplus right now that they could invest in education? It's in the billions for sure. Um, so I think it truly depends on how you who you ask because they'll tell you all well, there were different that surplus was created by one time um, stimulus money that was used in, in lieu of state funds. Um, but I, I do think we can get lost on the exact number of, oh, the state has this much money in surplus. The fact of the matter is they can figure out a scenario where this works, um, whether that's wanting to share the tax burden with property taxpayers with the revenue limit increase or footing the bill primarily through the state through categorical aid increases. Um, the fact of the matter is the state is looking at a surplus. We can we can work something out here. Um, but so long as legislators are focusing on general aid increase without a revenue limit increase, it will not do anything for this district. And that's the that's the key thing to emphasize with legislators moving forward. But then in do you know why they go to 2008 why they picked that year for the inflation i believe it had to do with exactly when yeah no, i could not say sure I, yeah yeah, it's a tri yeah isn't that the year that they, they stopped the adjustment the inflationary increase in a in a, the pupil i would have to look at the report but i, I believe that is, is that, and that was you know that was done by um democratic administration so this is not a, a partisan issue we've been suffering with these revenue caps um for a long time under and, I, and, 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 and on that partisan issue i i want to really emphasize that it's very easy in this discussion to say one party wants x and the other party wants y and to demonize one party over the other i am looking at fun we're looking at funding education here and this is not a time for bickering across come together and figure this out um, because truly our children's education is on the line here and we we the state need to come together and actually push um additional dollars 
additional spendable dollars for schools. And then before we go further, what do you actually think that special aid is going to go from? It's at 30 because in scenario six, they're, they're, they're proposing 90%. It. Yeah. It's important to note that there are private schools that, that they get quite a lot of special ed reimbursement. There are schools in the state that get 90% special ed reimbursement. So that's where that figure comes from. It's kind of looking at the state and saying, well, here you give, you give 90% to some, why not give it to all? Um, I will say a 90% special ed reimbursement is a lot. Um, and that's why I focus so much on that $1,500 per pupil. Um, that's a little bit, it, although special ed reimbursement will do quite a bit for us as a district. Um, there, I, I had a couple slides just explaining how that actually works last time, right? And if you're having a phone conversation with a, a legislator, it's a lot easier to say we need $1,500 per pupil than it is saying, let me explain the special ed categorical aid reimbursement system. Um, I years ago did some research on the cost of special education, and I'm sure it's worse now. But at one time, on the average, a special education student was two and a half times the cost of a regular education student because of the additional help that needs to be provided students. Um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to guarantee an education for every child and provide appropriate education for them. But it is more expensive. And when we, can, when we do not have the reimbursement from the state, then what happens, Dan? We have to take that, I think, out of the regular budget. We, we do, yeah, so when push comes to shove, and I really want to emphasize, we, we are legally required to meet the needs of special education students, and we want to do that. So that's that that's staying on the table. The question is to what extent we get reimbursed. Um, so we are required to have a balanced budget in Fund 27, the special education fund. So revenues must meet expenditures in that fund. So we get reimbursed a little bit, about $1.6 million. And I realize a little bit in, in, in reference to the entire fund, um, which can go up to about $8 million. Um, the rest of those dollars, the majority of it comes out of a transfer from the general fund, from fund 10 every single year. So that's why more money in reimbursement equals less transfer from fund 10. Um, so it's not a situation where we're taking money away from special education students. It's a situation where we're re being reimbursed more for providing those services. Um, so I think when we're talking about what is realistic here as far as special ed reimbursement is concerned, um, when we're looking at DPI scenario, they have a 5% next year and a 10% the year after that. Getting it to 45, I think, is within the realm of Madison doing. Um, I think getting it to 90 might be a tougher ask, but again, I would really focus on that $1,500 per pupil. Um, that would truly make a difference for the district. Any other questions on the scenarios before I kind of summarize where we're headed? <laughs> Are you meeting with the state legislation soon? Are you in... Uh, like what's the like plan of action in the next coming weeks? I so I would say, so I personally do not have a meeting on the books with any legislators, not, not saying I'm against that, but just right now, um, I would say the main thing is right now is step one, I would say is really this educating the board and our community as to what this looks like. Um, so Bader and I discussed a communication plan on this. Um, and, trying to get us mobilized, I would say step one. And you can't be mobilized until you know exactly what we're looking at here in uh, with a biennium. So hoping to have those conversations in the future. All right. I've, um, I've had a couple meetings um, with other, other school business officials across the state. Um, there was one piece of data I wanted to share with you that kind of gets this question of which scenario is most likely. Um, Baird present, gave a survey to, to school business officials. Over 100, about, about 150 responded. Um, and the, one of the key questions is, what do you believe next year's per pupil increase the revenue limit would be? And as you can see on this pie chart, or not pie chart, this bar graph here, 
Um, the answers vary quite significantly. Um, the, the most common answer was about $200 per pupil next year. Um, but the next, next highest was $100 per pupil. And then right, immediately right before that was zero. Um, so there, there are business officials in the state who are convinced that we will not get anything in the next biennium. Um, I would say give, even given last night's um, state of the state address and the Republican response, I would say it's likely we will get something. I, I think zeros is unlikely, at least I like to think so, um, because we are not alone in the situation. Two thirds of Wisconsin school districts are facing this exact same situation. And when I talk with other business officials in this area, we're all in the same boat. Um, so I'm not alone in trying to advocate for this. Um, we are not alone in this fight. Um, so I would be surprised if we get zeros. Now, 200 might be a, a more conservative and accurate estimate at this time. So that would be um, scenario number two. So presented six scenarios. Um, I would, so the first one being zeros, um, the scenarios two through four kind of being some minor increase to the revenue limit, medium increase, and um, and large increase to the biennium, sorry, not just the revenue limit. I would say scenarios two through four are the most realistic, and those are probably what should guide our budget discussions as we look into next year. Um, scenarios five and six are admirable. Uh, scenario five, DPI's ask, is a fair ask. And so scenario number six, $1,500 per pupil, I think is what we need to advocate for, because that would change our discussion completely for next year and the year after that. Um, so the governor is going to release his budget soon. The main thing to watch out for is the response to it, um, because I can the, the degree to which the other side denies it is going to be the key factor for us trying to figure out what's happening next. So when we look at scenarios two through four alone, um, we're looking at a deficit of potentially 1.2 to 680 thousand dollars. So 1.2 million to 680 thousand dollars next year. So if we were to say a we're facing a deficit of around a million dollars right now, I think that would be fair. The district is facing a, de a deficit of about 2.4 to 1.5 million dollars in 24-25. So about a $2 million deficit in the year after that when ESSER funds are completely de depleted. Um, so the, right now, that would be a fair ballpark. So this brings us to the toughest part of this conversation. Um, and it's not just gonna end tonight. This is something that we need to consider tonight and have more conversations about as we go through this budget process. All things said, the district truly has three options to mitigate a deficit. Um, and these three options can be used in tandem, in combination. It truly doesn't have to be one thing or the other. And I want to make it clear I'm not directing us at this point. Um, this is a board, has to be a board decision that does not have to be made tonight. But broadly speaking, our first option would be looking at cuts. As we discussed last time, the vast majority of expenditures in this district are personnel related. Cuts will have a direct impact on educational quality, or at least it's very likely it will. And that's something that we as educators do not want to see. Option two is deficit spending. That's simply running a year when expenses exceed our revenues for that year, in which case we run a deficit and draw out a fund balance. Running a deficit is not a permanent solution. And also there are negative consequences for doing so, primarily on district's um, credit rating, and then also just on our flexibility for meeting demands later. Uh, if our fund balance is low, that means we're cash flow borrowing. We are literally paying money to have enough cash in our banks. Um, so it's deficit spending is something that can be do done to a certain degree for a short period of time. It cannot be done for a long period of time. Option three is referendum. Um, referendum is, we, we have to be very careful with this, this option. 
Um, specifically, we are because we are ex we are still experiencing the benefits of the the past referendum that was passed. Unfortunately, as those funds come online, we're actually losing money because of our declining enrollment exemption fading away. And had the state actually kept pace with not even just inflation, but not just not given us zeros in the last two years, we would be in a completely different situation. That referendum would be would have been a lot more effective. In other words, for factors and reasons that were more or less unpredictable, because COVID was not on the radar when that referendum went out, um, we are facing this deficit situation, even though we have this referendum online. It's important to note as well that this community and this board, members of this board included, uh, have just experienced a high rate of tax increases for their property property taxes as a result of property assessments going up. That's a burden that an additional burden we'd be asking for our community. Um, finally, the last thing to think about with our a, a potential referendum is that the earliest we could go to referendum, or rather the earliest we should go to referendum, if this is on the table at all, would be the spring of 2024 for funds to come online for 24-25. That's explicitly going to, that, that will not help next year's deficit scenario. Um, it would help the year after that if we if we looked into that option. Um, so again, not directing your decision, but simply saying in broad strokes, these are our main. So um, at this point, I've done a lot of talking. I'd like to open a discussion with the board as to what we should do. Um, when looking at these scenarios, personally, I'm leaning a little bit to scenario two. I would say we as cab a cabinet are leaning towards scenario two. That is a $200 per pupil increase to the revenue limit. Um, so we'd be looking at a $1.2 million deficit in the scenario next year and a $3 million deficit the year after that. Um, so I'd just like to open it up to the board. Um, do you have any thoughts about potentially leaning towards a scenario or potentially going towards a different one? Um, would welcome your input. So following this for as many years as I've had, that actually might be just the small amount they would try to give us. When I look at the all other scenarios, I really wish we could get the uh, 750 raise with not even, uh, an increase on the special ed reimbursement from 30%. If we were going to lobby for something, hopefully that would be the super realistic one, even though we know we're probably going to get stuck with 200. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, if you look at the last several years of the revenue limit being indexed, um, rarely do you see 200s on that, that list. Um, but that doesn't mean that's not, we, we should not advocate for 1500. So I, I agree and that's, I, we can we could still get to that $1,500 amount per pupil just by looking at what we did not receive the last two years alone and indexing it for the next two years. I'd also state that these scenarios are quite realistic. And if we were gonna share these with, you know, all the taxpayers in South Milwaukee, this is very easy to have them see where we're at and why we're at that. You've kept it very, very simple. So it's very easy to explain to anyone, anyone to understand, or even when we lobby legislators, like that's it. No matter what they say, they invest historically. This is where we're at. And this is where we're going to be at. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And uh, that that truly is the goal of tonight's discussion is let's look at the, these scenarios in terms of a deficit for next year. Um, so I get these figures through uh, using the Baird forecast model. And even that scenario has a lot more detail that could be provided. Um, but truly tonight's goal for the discussion is targeting it towards that deficit for next year and the year after that. So I, I think that is exemplified in each scenario. So if we deficits agree to deficit spend next year in scenario two of 1.24 million, will we be able to recover that if we do? Or how will we recover that with the referendum 
being affected? Does that then pay back our what we've taken from fund balance, the referendum? Potentially, it, it truly depends on the size of that referendum. Um, but I, I would say it, we truly we mainly look at things through a fiscal year lens. So if we run a deficit in one year, um, we would probably try try our best to utilize all the dollars. We would try our best to utilize every dollar that we receive to to leverage for students. Um, so I don't. We the board can make the decision to intentionally run a surplus the year after to make up for a deficit the year prior, but um, that would be the board's decision. And ultimately, we have to ask ourselves: Do we want to instead utilize all that money? for our current students in that current year. That's a board decision. Um, but yes, it is a possibility to do that. When to referendum, would it be recurring or non-recurring to make up for these few years? So I I would recommend going to a recurring referendum. So the, 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 key, the key difference between a non-recurring and recurring is built into the name. So a recurring referendum is something you pass and it's built into your pure pupil allocation and the district keeps it moving forward forever. Non-recurring is set to a specific timeline. So Greenfield had a five-year re non-recurring referendum. That means that in five years, if you still need those dollars, you have to go to referendum again. Now, the board should consider that as an option, um, but it, for a longevity from a longevity perspective, a recurring referendum fixes your issues for the for the future. We're talking to other business administrators about what percentage of school districts were forced already to go to referendums. I think last year, I couldn't give you an exact number, but it was historic in the last last referendum. That was a little over like a hundred. Yeah, it is. It was over a hundred. I want to say, and the thing to note is and that's before the biennium passed um so there are districts who depending on the biennium they may say shoot and we need to go again if we have another year of zeros another biennium of zeros those bienniums that those uh those referenda that passed may not be sufficient so as a result most districts if they're considering going to referendum are considering it in the spring of 24 after the biennium is passed so it's important to note that there is no election in the fall of 23 here. So we, we can't necessarily go to, to, to referendum in the fall. We have to wait till the spring of 24 for funds going online on 24, 25. Um, if the biennium is not good, if it's zeros or even that 200 per pupil increase, I would be willing to bet that we would see a historic number of districts going to referendum in the spring of 24. You could see certain some districts might have to be insolvent. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. And get the referendum for sure. The majority of school district situation, uh, and we are with business managers that I'm talking with. We're all having very similar discussions with boards at this exact time. So Patrick, you brought up the. The, the idea of potentially deficit spending next year. Um, and this is a conversation that the board needs to have is to what degree is the board comfortable, if at all, with deficit spending next year? Because that will be a key, a key factor in determining our budget next year. And I mean, the worst case scenario, it's 1.6 million if they zero us out again even 1.24 if we get to measly 200. Correct. So if we deficit spend next year, 1.2 to 1.6, and the next year nothing changes, then we're having a much larger physical cliff because we didn't make those cuts a lot next year. Or Correct. Next year? Yes. So we'd be, we'd be looking at, so the zero projection, I think, I believe it was $3.8 million. Um, so the in 24-25. Um, so yes, if, if we, if as a board, the decision is made to not make cuts next year at all, and we just run the true deficit that we'd be facing next year, the year after that would be even larger. Um, so that's something that we have to keep in mind. 
and then that number doesn't even reflect um, if the negotiation is correct. That's a key factor in this. Yeah. Um, so, and that's something that as a board, we'll have to talk about is in closed session to what percentage are we putting in there for these assumptions? Anything else? Any questions? Patrick, you've asked a lot of really good, really good questions. A lot of good thoughts. Yeah. It's like in, in the future, it might, I mean, could it potentially be a, a mix of all three scenarios, really? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is completely possible to have cuts. But not cut everything to the point where we have a certain we have a balanced budget next year, and then run go for a referendum. All three are possibilities, and there may even be more. I want to emphasize that too. Um, but when we dis we discuss what's the, the three broad stroke options for next year as a cabinet, that's that's where we land. Is is it really it? Um, but yes, yeah, so you can use that in combination. I guess I would be more inclined to go with number two. Not go with um, scenario two, that yeah, is scenario right. Two, yeah, just, just be fair, but I don't know. I guess I'm hopeful that they're going to give us something, but at the same time, I'm not going to hold my breath for that. Mm -hmm. That's sad because number, number three is just $250. And instead of even funding fully our special ed, they're going to give us, oh, we'll give you another 5%. Those are such little asks. It's just maddening that you could be that immoral on trying to fund public education. I should emphasize that each of these scenarios are of our own making. Um, so we, we didn't get those exact numbers from a legislator. Um, but I, I think when we're hearing conversations from the state, um, there is a large narrative saying that school districts have received a historic amount of money and that they're being wasteful. Um, I want to emphasize that, yes, we have received more state aid, but the revenue limit has not increased. So therefore, we have not received additional dollars. We have received additional federal dollars, but those dollars are going away and they were intended to be used for COVID, not for keeping the lights on. Um, so there is an uphill battle as far as that narrative is concerned and correcting it, um, because there, there is a lot a lot of stories going around that districts across the state are being wasteful of money um, when there's simply more to that story. And there's a lot of districts that are considering dissolution, mm -hmm. closing down, mm -hmm. and taking out a school from a community. Can you imagine the impact of, of that? I, you know, the school board, you got to do what is necessary. But it seems to me one of the dangers in saying we can live with zero is you will live with zero. And there's also a responsibility to say, what do we need to run a school district effectively so the kids continue to learn? Is there any possibility of, of being able to do both, Dan, to have a plan that that funds? As I, I, as I go out to the schools, I don't see a lot of places to cut right now. And so when we have to start cutting, um, I've done that before. You've done that before. We can do it again. But don't we also have a responsibility to plan an educational program that educates the, the children the way we think they should be educated? So it's really a, it's a dilemma to me about picking one over the other. I wish... If if we say we can live with zero, is that what will will happen to us? And if we say that we need five hundred, and they get, they say, well, you can't have. I mean, you. I don't want to put the school district back them into a corner where we get stuck with a minimum kind of of um, budget. So, I you have to be wise and plan for nothing. But we also have to plan for something that we that we think we need to run the district. But it's important to note that we really have two tasks in front of us. One is what do we advocate for? And that is, I would say, the $1,500 SWSA ask 
um, for for next the next. So that's what we need. You think they're. I, I would say data. my that recommendation data. would be to advocate for that because I know that there are other districts. We should join the districts in our area and across the state in asking for this. We should have one narrative and one voice. So I would say we should we should join forces and ask for fifteen hundred dollars per pupil in the next biennium. That's task one. Task two is what do we budget for and how do we plan? Unfortunately, the biennium will not be finalized by the time that we actually have to make these decisions. It's just the way it works. So we have to we have to decide what are our assumptions and we have to do that and really by the next meeting here. Um, so it's a tough job ahead of us. Dan, when you mentioned that other districts are making the same ask um, are, and we should join forces, is there like a formal effort to do that? Yes. Um, so I would say the minimum level, so SWSA is, is I attached the, their statement on, on board book. <laughs> on another level, I've been working with business officials in our, in our area to release a joint statement with our boards. So ideally sometime in February, we had looked to actually pass a, a joint, a, a resolution together um, to, to call attention to this. So yes. So I guess the question with that is after today, um, as a board, is that $1,500 per pupil? Are you guys comfortable with advocating and coming to an agreement on saying, this is our ask, this is what we like from the state? Absolutely. And we need to let people know that yeah. we need people to know. So I expect, so in the upcoming weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll make that a little bit more formalized. Um, but I, I think with conversations with stakeholders, with legislators, that $1,500 SWSA ask is something we should lean towards then. If there's nothing else, about the scenarios. The last item I have to present upon is the, the budget prioritization survey. So for this upcoming budget cycle, um, we'd like to present you as a board and other key stakeholders with a budget survey to kind of guide this process. Um, so the goal would be you as a board would respond, um, and then we'd have the administrators respond, and that would guide our discussions moving forward. So we have a, um, a draft of that survey in your board packet. Um, and the, take this as an opportunity to provide input because we haven't actually made it yet in a survey format for you to take. So we wanted to bring it to you for to your attention so that you could ask questions about it so we can make any changes you would like so that we re you receive the survey that you would like, and then we can provide that same survey to other key stakeholders. So there are two basic questions on the survey. Uh, so if you open it up on your board packet, that's one of the attachments. The first question is essentially list your top three priorities when determining the budget for next year. Um, and then there's a host of priorities such as class sizes and um, submitting timely financial information, et cetera. Um, so the ask would be for you to list your three top priorities there. And then the second question would be a repeat of the same scenario, but with choose your lowest priorities amongst those, that same list. So if that survey is okay with you, um, we, we would send that out to you to, to be completed by this week, Sunday. So that can guide our budget discussions, but we can definitely add or take away from it as you see fit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can I write in, the way I'm reading this, my understanding is that we're we're asking if we want to continue kind of maintaining the things that we have in place now. Not, none of these questions are around like adding anything. Am I right? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to be sure I had the same or the yeah. right understanding.
I think three out of 24 is. <laughs> but I've been looking through and I read through them before and I it's hard to figure out some too. Yep. To take away or combine or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm sure you, that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. Could I go back? Um, there was someone asked about how people are going to ask for this. In board book, we also have um, from Swasa, and I see that Mr. Shaw is quoting it. Could you explain to the board what SWAS is and how SWAS will be lobbying on behalf of our? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, sorry, I didn't explain it earlier. So the SWSA, so Southwestern, um, sorry, Southeastern, Southeastern, what am I saying? Southeastern Wisconsin School, um, School Alliance is is our lobbying group i would say so we it's we are the fiscal agents of this group so we literally handle the bills uh associated with this group so every school district that's a member um, pays a due and i couldn't tell you exactly how many districts are members um but it's quite a few and essentially we have a lobbyist a group that actually is in madison um hearing the discussions taking place and lobbying on our behalf um, so with, when we're talking about the SWSA ask and this $1,500 per pupil, that's the ask that the executive team came together of that group. And that's made up of a of several superintendents in our area, um, and our, our lobbyists and figured out what we should ask for. And that's how we got to the $1,500 per pupil amount. Um, so I was part of those discussions. Um, and then we brought it to our general um, membership, which is again series of, of superintendents, board members, and stakeholders in our area, and we were in agreement that this is the number we should ask for. So they are on the ground trying to push that number right now, um, and the the hope is that we can actually have boards come together on this figure. Now, with getting that messaging out, I can tell for a fact that at two years ago, going to everyone at Jesse Rodriguez's opening listen session, a lot of times with Blaze, um, I would summon up to the very land after two years of trying to explain to her that we're being starved. Uh, she said, I don't hear about that except from you two, meaning Blaze and myself. So there's a far needle to move in lobbying that person for funding. I can tell you right now that several business managers have met with legislators in person and have explained this exact situation. So I'd be surprised if she's just hearing that from us at this point. If nothing else, because Blaze went to Oak Creek and now there's two districts that, that are having this. So. And to have an ask that is shared is, uh, that's major progress, I think. We're hoping that it catches some attention. Yes. 